microdosing guide, winter solstice microdosing guide, um, microdosing through the shadows. If you didn't, and if you want, um, Alana will drop that in the, um, she'll drop that in the, in the chat there and uh, you can download that, but we're going to riff on that. So I had this really awesome, super fancy presentation prepared for you all today. And it disappeared from my Google Drive. I've never had anything disappear from my Google Drive. When I clicked on it, I said it wasn't available anymore. It was all my notes and all my my slides and everything. And um, talk about uh, a lesson acceptance and receptivity, like we talked about in the in that passage I just read, and and not reactive, uh, and not you know. Um, not being a slave to the trigger of of that. So why am I telling you this? Because winter solstice is a great time to let go, right? It's a great time to, we're dormant, and then we're letting go maybe of things that don't serve us any longer, right? The leaves on trees, okay? That's a telltale sign that those trees don't need those leaves in order to conserve their energy, right? People, places, things, relationships, uh, projects, whatever it might be. Uh, so I used it as a great lesson of impermanence, that everything is constant, everything is in motion, and nothing changes if nothing changes. And the only thing that is constant is change. It is inevitable. Okay. And that's just really something to pay attention to, especially when we're in a microdosing practice. So a lot of what we present here has really nothing to do about microdosing itself. Okay. <laughs> And um, who am I? You know, who is this guy that's been blabbing at you? My name is Brian Martell Chaplin, and uh, I am the founder of a small but mighty brand called Medicine Box. I started that in uh, 2016 uh, in the medical cannabis days in Northern California. And that's why I mentioned um, my co-founder, Michael Hollister. And uh, I had three good years with Michael, um, and he lost his battle to cancer uh, on the strawberry full moon of 2018. He actually um, passed away in a Buddhist um, hospice up in Trinidad Bay in uh, Humboldt County, way up there. Um, and he took his last breath as he saw the moon rise, the full moon, strawberry full moon rise um, in the horizon as he was looking through the window. Uh, that's how much of a tuned in um, human being that Michael was. And he merged in with the universe. And a lot of his teachings I try to infuse um, into this um, brand and um, present to all of you. And uh, take what you need, leave the rest. And um, I hail from uh, the Granite State of New Hampshire. I've lived in uh, North Lake Tahoe for 21 years. I moved here to be a ski bum. I'm a ski bum at heart. I still ski about 60 days a year. Um, you can find me you know, swimming in the lake, hiking on mountaintops, meditating in the forest, hugging trees. And just being surrounded by um, beautiful nature. I'm looking at the the lake right now. I'm facing east. Um, I'm in Washu, uh, Washu Native American territory here, uh, right on the state line of uh, California in Nevada. And um, some context, my backstory, uh, I think here. Um, you know, I'd like to think that we're all on this presentation because. Uh, you might be dealing with some anxiety, some depression, some despair, um, some lack of hope, some confusion, some uncertainty, some fear, maybe some addictions, some neurosis, and you just want your life to be better. Well, in 2012, um, I really just wanted my life to be better. I was a um, raging alcoholic, drug addict um, since I was 14 years old, you know, for 18 years of my life. I used alcohol and drugs to um, escape, to cope, to manage my emotions, um, to say, fuck it. Um, I thought I was having a great time. You know, I was a straight A student, you know, one of those like overachievers, right? Um, things came easy to me. I could smile and nod, get my way out of a lot of trouble. Um, consequences didn't matter to me. And um, I found myself in a deep uh, rut in my life, despair. Um, I had no hope. I didn't want to live, uh, simple things like doing my laundry, uh, created anxiety and panic in my life. 
Um, I shut myself out from friends and family and I became estranged to a lot of loved ones in my life and uh, found myself in a hospital bed looking up at the ceiling and saying, well, this isn't my ceiling, which I call, um, this is not my ceiling syndrome. I was in a hospital bed in San Francisco uh, under suicide watch. I had OD'd um, on drugs and alcohol, but no one told me I was an addict. No one told me that I had a problem. I think people um, around me were scared to tell me, including my family. Uh, and it took me another nine nine months to, actually no, another 18 months to uh, get my proverbial shit together. And um, by the grace of God, uh, divine intervention, uh, the house I'm sitting in right now that I eventually bought, um, my neighbors are sober. And when I first met them, they told me they were sober. And um, I didn't think anything of it. I was like, you guys are crazy. Who, who lives around? Who lives a sober lifestyle? How do you even do that? Right. I'm drinking a beer in the middle of the day on a Tuesday, thinking that's what everyone did. That's how people lived normally. My life was chaotic. It was filled with drama. It was filled with um, just disgust, really, uh, guilt, shame, um, the cycle. It was a cycle. And uh, I had a moment of clarity uh, after, you know, a three day run on the old, I'm just going to have a couple drinks tonight and I'll go out with you. Turned into three days later. Called my mom, walked next door. I was like, I have an idea. Um, my neighbor said he's sober, and I walked next door. I think it's 17 steps I counted. And I used those three little words that are so hard to use. Does anyone know what they might be? I need help. And eventually I went into the 12 step program and, um, here I am 11 years later and spare you all the boring details of, of AA and the 12 step program, but they saved my life. I still go to meetings regularly. Um, I do not go, uh, because I am a threat to myself that I'm going to drink and fall off the proverbial wagon, but there's this beautiful triangle in recovery, unity, service, recovery. Okay. And, um, to have a perfect equilateral triangle, you need all three of those legs to really hold themselves up. So the whole unity consciousness of recovery um, and the service commitment that I have for the, the person that might be new, might be shaken in his or her boots being like, what am I doing? Why am I here? This is crazy. Um, filled with fear. So I go to support others and to hear um, the things I need to hear. And then I share these with, with all of you. Um, so I've applied a lot of the principles of my recovery process with microdosing and I began microdosing and taking psychedelics, you know, since I was 17, I'm 43 now, but it was always recreationally and throughout recovery. And I'm transparent about this. Um, I've used psychedelics regularly to get to the deeper layers of my, um, you know, pr proverbial problems. I don't think of them as problems, obstacles, right? The symptoms or anxiety or depression or fear or neurosis. These are all symptoms of a much larger issue and addiction and all of that. It can kind of be folded into each other. They're not, they're not separate, right? They're not, um, they're not separate from one another or compartmentalized. It usually is kind of this vortex tornado happening. And at the root of all of that is a psychological wound. Okay, it might be a trauma from your childhood. It might be guilt that you haven't moved through your body. It could be shame. It could be low self-worth, self-pity. But at the root of the root of the root of the root of all of this, and again, you'll hear me say this, microdosing helps us get to the root of the root of the root in a very gentle, gentle way to uncover the psychological bedrock that we have compounded over many years of our life, right? To scrape away the psychological bedrock, to plant our spiritual seeds of the future. Hmm. Solstice to equinox, scraping away the psychological bedrock and the dormancy of winter to plant the spiritual seeds of our future in the spring equinox when the soil is starting to loosen up and we can till it 
add some compost to it, and then wait for summer solstice when the sun is the highest in the sky to give us all that guiding light, and then to harvest the bountiful yields of whatever we are putting forth as our intention in the autumn equinox. And that's how I like to think. I like to think in uh, not just quarters, but in seasonal shifts. And if we can get ourselves into the rhythms of nature, everybody, we have a fighting chance at dealing with this crazy effed up world. And the world is effed up right now, but I'm here to tell you that you don't have to be and you are not alone, okay? And we all go through this anxiety, this depression, this despair, okay? So that's a little insight to who I am and the mission of Medicine Box is to create full health sovereignty, to co-create full health sovereignty using plant-based therapeutics. Um, and I consider myself a cognitive humanitarian. And what is that? I believe that everyone um, on this planet has the basic right to explore their own consciousness without anyone telling you that you can't, without anyone telling you that you can't take a psychedelic or, or smoke a cigarette or even drink whiskey, whatever it might be, if that is a tool for you and you're exploring your own consciousness, of course, one of, you know, a lot of those um, substances are very spiritually constricting, but I think of the ones that are spiritually expansive mushrooms, microdosing cannabis and using it in a very sustainable manner. And the only difference between medicine and poison is the dose. So that as a cognitive humanitarian, I invite all of you as well to become cognitive humanitarians and explore your own consciousness, whatever modality that you like to use. And that could be meditation, prayer. Um, it could be breath work, yoga, uh, whatever it might be. And I started Medicine Box based on the problem that I told you all about. It came, the idea came to me in a, in a 12 step meeting saying, wow, there's people on Xanax and opiates and um, Ambien and Lexapro and per, um, the Prozac, well, Butrin and all these things. And it's like, wait, you're sober? Like, but cannabis is bad. Um, psychedelics were bad. Side note, Bill W., the founder of AA, took LSD for many, many years, for like seven straight years in the 50s, as he saw it being a very promising solution um, to alcoholism an addiction and to give us uh, a daily reprieve from our spiritual maladies. And uh, he so pushed for that, but it became shut down. Um, seven pillars of medicine box. So I threw these slides together. I had a much more in-depth um, presentation, but this, uh, the seven pillars of medicine box, and I invite all of you to think of what, what are some of the pillars in your own life? Okay, and and the seven pillars of medicine box are mindfulness, music, food, community, collaboration, recovery, and nature being the evolving medium that weaves it all together. And um, I believe we are all addicted to something while we're all recovering from something. So think about that during this um, presentation. Like addiction, it has this like cringy sound to it, has a negativity to it. Um, maybe it's a dependency. Maybe it's a neurosis. Maybe it's the thing that we do to get us out of the present moment. Gabor Mati says that addiction is just to get us out of the present moment. Whatever we can do to not be in that present moment, right? To not sit with ourselves. So find your the things in your life that you might be addicted to. Maybe it's walking to the refrigerator like seven times, you know, after 8 p.m. when you know you shouldn't, you know, be eating after 8 p.m. or doom scrolling or um, any of the number of weird things that all humans do, but we're also all recovering from something. And that is the yin to the yang. Okay. That is the black to the white. That is the duality of being human. But as you'll see with microdosing psychedelics, we want to go from a place of duality. Yes, no, black, white, light, dark, hot, cold. Those are all what humanisms human over years have made up um, these words to describe, to um, uh, subject us to different concepts and really just to categorize the way we move about in the world. So going from a place of 
uh, duality to non-duality, right? It's basic taking the puzzle pieces and sticking them together or non-duality when you're looking out at a beautiful view and you can exhale and you're like, wow, that's beautiful. In that very moment, it might be a split second. There is no past and there is no future. It is right now. That is non-duality. And that is where we are always aspiring to be. So who is this for? All of you. Um, people are open-minded. You value your well-being and the well-being of those around you, those who want to be accountable for their health and happiness. And you want to be a part, highlighted a part of the solution to the mental health epidemic. You want to understand what it means to be fully human. I just talked about that a, a little bit. To be fully human, right? To accept our character defects, to accept our spiritual maladies, to accept our past and not so hyper-focused future, okay? Being here right now, not being driven by the ghosts of our past and neither being driven by the future fears and fantasies of some future ahead of us. It doesn't exist, okay? That's being fully human. And before we get to the how, we must know the why, all of this. Okay, so we're in a age of anxiety, everybody. We're in crisis mode. Um, there's a lot of epidemics and the world is effed up. There's famine happening. There's wars happening. People are being murdered, economic disparity, and all the things. A very toxic system, very toxic world, really. And um, we're all participants in that. And the three inevitable forces that I see we're collectively facing is anxiety, 40 million humans, depression, one in 10 people, addiction. That was 20 million until about an hour ago when I did some more research and it's up to 46 million, 46 million people this past year um, have said that they have some sort of substance abuse disorder. Okay. And you could be a functional drinker, right? Maybe it's the three glasses of Chardonnay at night, but you can put the bottle of Chardonnay in the refrigerator, but then you go escape into Netflix. So you don't um, grab the bottle of Chardonnay. You need to distract yourself from that. So, Think about the areas in your life, and there's nothing wrong with that. Again, I'm here to tell you, you're not broken. There's nothing to be fixed, okay? And there's nothing wrong. There's no right way, wrong way, just a lot of different ways. Um, we talked about why I started Medicine Box is really to make a dent on all of that, right? If we could make a dent on a sliver of those statistics, um, we're doing a good job. Additional facts here, 100,000 people died in 2021 from drug overdoses. 70% of our population is prescribed to a pharmaceutical drug. There's over 300 million people in the United States. Last year, 70 million people were prescribed ADHD medications. Just think about that for a second. Are people that unfocused and distra distracted that they need a medication to help them focus and concentrate? Or is it the system that we're in? The crazy world, the modern, the modern um, uh, advantages that we have with technology that distract us. And are those 70 million people actually want to look at maybe why they can't focus or why they can't concentrate? Or do they just want to pop a pill? The American way. America, yeah. ADHD is the phenomenon of training the mind to escape the present moment when it is uncomfortable. The phenomenon of training the mind, and a lot of times we train the mind subconsciously, right, or unconsciously to escape the present moment. And let me give you a good example of that. You all work on computers, I'm, I'm guessing, right? You all have jobs. And if you're sitting there, you're writing, you have writer's block, or you're trying to, you know, navigate a spreadsheet, and it's just not flowing easily, and it's uncomfortable because our mind is not working fast enough. It's not getting through the pro the problem right? That's presented to us, right? Our creativity might be lapsing. And what do we do? We open up another tab. We check an email. We open Slack. We watch the YouTube video. We open Spotify, right? We get up, we pace around, we do whatever it is to get out of that present moment. And that is the phenomenon of training the mind to escape the present moment when it is uncomfortable instead of just leaning into it. 
Okay. And microdosing will help us lean into that. I have this saying, don't just say no, say yes, whatever's coming up, invite it in. Okay. That's a riff on Nancy Reagan. Just say no, just say yes. And I'd say these numbers alone create what I call an ecology of anxiety. So all of that. And then you think of the 100,000 people, everybody that died from drug overdoses in 2021. I knew people in that statistic. That's not really quite a statistic. When you look at the compounded effect of the loved ones, the friends, the family, the coworkers that may have been connected um, to those people that passed away. And that number increases exponentially. And you all have this guide. I'm just going to go through it real quick because really what I want to do is um, I want to make sure that you all have time for questions um, about microdosing, um, about protocols, tips, tricks. Of course, we have a ton of that on our website. Um, and anything that comes to mind about the presentation, anything that comes to mind about addiction, but please, please don't be shy with your questions. Um, really just wanted to make this just a, a, a fun and engaging session uh, for all of you on winter solstice. And it warms my heart that you're all sticking around. So here it is. You probably already read it over, but 10-step um, winter solstice microdosing guide, enhanced mood. Um, these dark days of winter, we talked about um, damp in the brightest of spirits. Sad. Someone talked about that. Um, and microdosing is believed to interact with the serotonin receptors, much like a whisper to the brain. Increased creativity. So when the world outside is a canvas of white and gray and it's dark and it's gray and it's dismal and the sun's setting, you know, it might just add a splash of color to your mental palette. I love that. A splash of color to your mental palette. Um, by fostering neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is that fancy word for just creating new experiences, um, new opportunities, or this window of opportunity. If you think of, um, I'm a skier, but if you've seen skiers like ski down a mountainside um, with fresh powder and go back up the chairlift, um, chances are that skier is not going to ski down the same track. They're going to go find a new fresh field of powder because it's amazing. Um, that's essentially neuroplasticity, but the opposite of that is the rut, right? We go in these ruts, um, and that's the grooves, the deep grooves in our neural pathways. And why do we do that? Well, it's habitual. It's a pattern. It's a maladaptive behavior. It's a thought process. It's an emotional reaction, not the the um, because it requires less energy from the brain to create a new experience. So less energy from the brain to create a new experience. But neuroplasticity, microdosing helps us. It guides us. It opens us up to those windows of opportunities to create new experiences, uh, new neural pathways to be able to get out of that thought pattern, right? To get out of that emotional trigger, to create a new experience. Maybe it's a new boundary with yourself. Maybe it's a simple pause when your spouse is talking to you or your kids are triggering you and you take a deep breath, that is neuroplasticity, everybody. Okay. Or like the, I am awesome versus I suck, right? I'm, I'm hard on myself, everybody. I'm super hard on myself. And there's times where I'm like, dude, you suck. You're an idiot. You're so stupid. And, and, and that's, those are, that's just stuff that has come up from my childhood and, and my past. And instead of doing that, having more positive self-talk, but it encourages the brain to form new connections and think outside the proverbial box, potentially leading to a surge in creative output. And that's what just with creativity. This can be, you can switch that up from increased emotional stability, increased mental fitness, increased focus, increased connection, increased um, clarity, increased consciousness, increased communication. Okay. So when you have this, go over that and you can cross that word creativity out and you can replace it with a lot of the ones, and that that would be a good homework assignment for y'all. Improved focus. Um, as the winter sun wanes, uh, our ability, so can our ability to concentrate. Well, I, I don't know about you all, but when it gets dark, I'm done. Like my my concentration is like, uh, what do I do now? I'm going to play the guitar. You know, I'm just finding stupid things to do around my house um, instead of really concentrating on the things I want to concentrate on. So 
um, microdosing might sharpen mental clarity and uh, aiding in productivity and mental acuity when you need it most. Stress reduction. This is a big one. We all have stress. As long as we are dealing with people, places, and things, and we are human, as far as I know, we're all human here, um, we're going to get stressed, okay? The modern world is a stressful place, okay? We have so much connection in this world with modern technologies, but we are so disconnected at the same time. Think about that. We have so much connection in this world with modern technology, but we are so disconnected at the same time, disconnected from nature, from people, and ourselves. And microdosing has the potential to act as a psychological diffuser, which spreads this sense of calm throughout the mind and body, which may help in managing the heightened stress and anxiety that often come with cold or darker days. Um, I do get anxious around, uh, personally speaking, around the colder, darker days because there's something that goes on in my mind that it's like, oh, it's getting dark soon and the day's ending, right? The day's over, right? It's like um, morning time lasts until 2 p.m. and then it's dark two and a half hours later, right? It's like, oh, okay. So that can build a bit of anxiousness and overwhelm that we didn't get everything done that we wanted to get done today. I didn't produce all the things I wanted to do. I didn't knock off my my checklist and, oh, no, you know, tomorrow's another day in a loop. You all know the loop. Boosted energy levels. Think of it as a warm inner glow. The body's energy ebbs and flows with the light of day. That's our circadian rhythm. So what I suggested earlier in our discussion was if you could get up before the sun, okay, and get that um, all the full spectrum of light and the sun, the arc of the sun all day long, um, you're going to have much more energy to work with. Someone else talked about um, conserving energy or the, the, um, the light, gaining the light of energy um, from the sun and the light energy of people. So uh, boosted energy levels, emotional stability, um, resilience and stability through the natural ups and downs. Let's just face it. It's the holiday season. We're, we're busy. We're running around. There's a lot of expectations around the holidays, isn't there, everybody? You're traveling, you might be getting on planes, you might be grabbing kids and putting them on planes, and you get to play Santa Claus, you got to go to, you know, Aunt Gertrude's house and Uncle Bobby's, and you don't really want to do that. You got to smile and on, smile and on, a lot of expectations they let down. So that emotional roller coaster, it's a challenging ride, especially this time of year. Add that on with the shorter days of the year. Um, it's a, it's a tough combination. Okay. So resilience. Okay. That's a great word. Resilience. What are those trees doing outside that we talked about earlier? They're staying resilient through the winter, through the chaotic storms and the ice and the snow and the winds. Okay. They're staying resilient. I don't know how they do that. They just do it. Right. I like looking around at the mountains around here in Tahoe and ask myself, what is that mountain doing right now? Nothing. It's doing nothing. It's just sitting there. It's just, it's being super stoic and strong and resilient and grounded and centered. And some of the winds that go over those ridge tops can reach up to a hundred miles per hour. And the wind is blustering and it's blowing snow and it's freezing. Um, and it, they're just hanging out. They're just doing their thing. So remember that we can be resilient through the natural ups and downs. Enhanced mindfulness and presence. Uh, there's a great um, uh, research article uh, done by Joseph Rootman, and he interviewed, surveyed over 8,000, about 8,000 people through the um, uh, Harvard Medical. And um, the majority of those people uh, that responded why they wanted to microdose was to have enhanced mindfulness or increased mindfulness and presence. And I think of microdosing as sped up mindfulness. Okay. What is sped up mindfulness? Sped up mindfulness is nothing more than just being still in the present moment, free of judgment, observing the ebbs and flows of our thoughts, not being attached to the thoughts, just letting them flow. And funny story, um, these mala beads that I'm wearing, these are from my friend, um, Bhante uh, Supuri, and he is a Sri Lankan Buddhist monk He's in his 50s, and he's been a Buddhist monk since he was eight years old, okay? And um, Bhante messaged me recently, text a Buddhist monk, 
texting me. Uh, that's just, it's a trip, right? You got a Buddhist monk texting you. Uh, there's just something that is just cute and paradoxical about that. But he was asking me about microdosing because he wants to get some microdose products for his father who has dementia over in Sri Lanka. So we talked a lot about sped up mindfulness. And I'm like, I feel funny telling a Buddhist monk that microdosing is like sped up mindfulness, but that helped him understand exactly what it is. So think of it as sped up mindfulness. Okay. You can sit and meditate 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, which I also recommend M&Ms, microdosing and meditation. Um, you can do breath work. I also recommend combining breath work and microdosing. But when you combine these modalities or stack them together, you're going to get much more enhanced mindfulness and presence. And I think we all want that, right? My present every year for people in my life, birthdays, anniversaries, whatever it may be, is my presence, okay? Yeah. That's how I think of giving my time to others um, instead of gift exchanges. Like spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with people um, and build those relationships, right? Um, it's one thing being in a group, in a community with people, but having that quality time, call your mother, call your father, call your brother, call your sister. If you are so fortunate to have those people in your life, every moment has the potential to be a meditation. Okay. I heard a great one the other day that every day is a holiday when you're spiritually present. Okay. The expectations around Christmas, right? Thanksgiving, right? We have all these expectations and what is an unmet expectation, everybody? A resentment. Resentments are nothing but expectations under construction. So have that enhanced mindfulness in that presence and just let things be exactly as they are in this present moment without attaching to any outcomes. And the more we practice this, the more we have this sped up mindfulness, we're going to be much happier people. We're not going to get let down because we don't have expectations. People, places, and things aren't going to annoy us because we don't have expectations and we're not going to judge the things that are happening. We're not going to be conditional in the unconditional flow of the universe. Remember the passage I read, harmonizing into the flow of the universe instead of resisting it. So have that heightened state of awareness and the connection to the here and now. Uh, so social connectivity, this is it right here. This is why I had you all participate at the beginning of this um, presentation was to have that social connectivity, even though you're talking through a screen, even though um, we are tethered to these stupid devices um, every single day. Um, but get out there. You know, when the cold draws us apart, microdosing might weave the threads of connection. It could be the warmth that brings us closer, enhancing empathy, right? Putting yourself in other people's shoes and connecting in this shared joy of companionship, melting away the walls we build when we're cold, right? The walls we build when we're cold equals isolation, okay? It's very easy to do that. But get out there. Maybe it's once, once a week. Once every two weeks, go to a library, go to a coffee shop, um, do something, you know, that is around other people. And, you know, people can be annoying. I get it. Um, but make sure you do that. Improve sleep patterns. This is a good one. I don't know how microdosing improves sleep patterns, but the only uh, logical kind of anecdotal answer I have for people when they ask me this is, well, you're forced into the present moment in the here and now, and you have that sped up mindfulness and you're acting more in your authentic self. You're being more genuine with yourself. You might be more creative, might be more communicative, might have that social connectivity. So it dispels all that worry, right? All that fear-based thinking that we have and fear, the acronym for fear is false evidence appearing real, right? Doesn't exist. Our minds like to make it up. Okay, so by being forced into that present moment, we don't have those ruminating thoughts, which helps with improved sleep patterns and pattern circadian rhythm. Remember getting up early before the sun and watching the sunrise, if you can, and then having the full spectrum of daylight every single day and get yourself into that circadian rhythm. And what is the trick for waking up early, everybody? going to bed early and microdosing might serve as the anchor and the nocturnal tide potentially sinking the body's clock to natural rhythms, right? That's that circadian rhythm that I mentioned of the earth leading to deeper, more restorative sleep. Someone used restorative or restoration earlier um, or rejuvenation. I can see how this is all 
weaving in all these fun concepts, everybody. And number 10, yes, spiritual insights. The winter solstice has always been a time of inner reflection in spiritual depth. Y'all nailed it. Boom. At the beginning. Or did you read this before and get some hints? I'm, I'm going to say that you all came up with all of that. So the inner reflection and spiritual depth, right? To inner reflect so we can plant, plant the spiritual seeds for our future. And microdosing could magnify this inward journey, right? We're in this inward journey introspection, offering glimpses into the soul's winter landscape, revealing insights and wisdom that only the longest night can unveil. So that wraps up the super fancy presentation that I threw together. 